Today, my message is entitled, Rejoice and Weep Together. Rejoice and Weep Together. Please take out your Bibles, if you have them, and turn to Romans 12, okay? We're going to be diving into uh, verses 14 and 15 for this week. I think this is like the fifth message of Romans 12, so... We're going really deep in Romans 12. It's great, okay? And so I'm going to con- concentrate first on <clears throat> verse 15. Oh, by the way, does anyone here have a cough drop I could borrow? I won't give it back, though. Anyone? <laughs> okay. I think it's getting around in, into that season where temperature is suddenly changing, so a lot of us are having, like, sore throats and, and colds and stuff. So if you have that like me, I pray for God's healing upon you, okay? Okay, so Romans 12, 14 and 15. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And so I'll concentrate on verse 15 first, and the Living Bible translates it this way. It says, when others are happy, be happy with them. And if they are sad, Share their sorrow. And the Message Bible puts it this way. Laugh with your happy friends when they're happy and share tears when they're down. Okay. Now, there are a couple ways that, that we can interpret these couple verses. Okay. We can read this and interpret it in a, in a general way. Right? You can search online like, how, to be, how do I be an empathetic person? How do I be a sympathetic person? If you just Google that, many articles will, will pop up, okay, such as this one. You guys ever use a WikiHow? You know that website, WikiHow? Like, they, you know, they'll teach you a lot of stuff, right, like how to do stuff. And they don't just list, like, the one, two, threes. The, the special thing with WikiHow is they draw every step out. They have all the different illustrations. So you know exactly what it looks like. Okay, so I, I just Googled, you know, how do we be empathetic? And, and, and this, this article pops up, okay? And, and, you know, step one, express your sympathy, right? Or, you know, if we, if we take this verse, can we just plop it into Wicked How and let it be like an instruction thing? For example, step one could be, hey, laugh with your happy friends when they're happy. That could be step one, right? So let's, let's just go ahead and practice that a little bit. Just look to your neighbor and go, ha, 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 just, just laugh with them. Ha, 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 ha. Don't, don't laugh at them, laugh with them, okay? Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> okay, very good. You guys are doing great. And then step number two, you know, share your tears, you know, when they're down. So look at each other with a, with a sad face, like, oh. You know, that, that's like the upper right corner, right? Showing sympathy, right? And then step three, you know, this is, this is what they said. You know, what does that look like on the bottom right corner? What, what's that guy doing? It's like, he's saying, don't act harsh or uncaring towards your friends and just calling that tough love. Like, man, you should shape up, man. Like, don't do that. <laughs> that's not how you be sympathetic to people, Okay. Uh, and so, you know, if we see this in a general way, it's like, well, if you follow these steps, like one, two, three, four, then you're, you're on your way to become a better human being. You're on your way to become a better friend, a better husband, and a better father, you know? And is that true in general? Is that true? Yes, actually, it is true. I'm not trying to make fun of it, okay? When we are genuine in our sympathy, Not like the fake laughs that we just had a minute ago, okay? I'm not talking about that. But being a sympathetic person is a positive thing. All right, you can be, actually, you can be a non-Christian. You can be a Buddhist and Hindu and still cultivate sympathy in your life. And there are many stories of acts of compassion, of sympathetic acts of charity from, from the world outside of the Christian faith. Okay, we'll find that in the church, and we'll find that outside of the church. And that can happen because all men and women and boy, boys and girls are, we are made in God's image as human beings. 
And God is a God of compassion, a God who shows great sympathy towards his children. And so all humans are made in the image of God, in his likeness. And so therefore, human beings in general, have, we value compassion, we value sympathy, right? And, and these, these are good things that the good Lord has bestowed upon all of humanity. And in theology, we call that common grace. We call this term common grace. Why is it common grace? Because it is the grace of God that is common to all of mankind. To all of mankind. Okay, so that's common grace. The Bible says in Matthew 5.45 that he causes his son, the son, to rise on the evil and the good. What does that mean? The sun shines on the evil and the good. The sun represents a good thing, a blessing, right? And so God causes the sun to rise on the good and the bad. That's common grace. All right, good things happen to everyone. And in the same way, God's character also reflects upon his creation. And so whether they are saved or not saved, we reflect those characters and we value those things. So, for example, non-believers, can, they can donate to World Vision. And they can sponsor hungry children. Or they'll, they'll write out a check for their family because they have a financial need. They'll, they'll write out that check. They can rejoice also with those who rejoice. You know, maybe because, I don't know, maybe they just bought a, like a Mustang or something. And they're like, hey, you know, hey, you got a Mustang, I'm happy for you. Okay. Or they can weep with those who weep. Like if a family member passed away, well, yeah, it's, it's in our human nature to weep with those who weep when someone passes away. And, and I, I thank God for that, the common grace upon all humanity for us to be able to do that. And I thank God that I have been a recipient of sympathy from people that, that have no understanding of Jesus. I've been a recipient. I've been blessed by them. When, I was have, when our family was having financial difficulties. God used my non-Christian family to have sympathy towards us, to have love towards us. And they gave love gifts to us because we were having one kid after another. The expenses were really high. You know? So our, our family helped us out. And we were re- very grateful for that. Okay, that's, that's common grace. And so while the common grace of compassion the common grace of sympathy upon all mankind. That, that is an amazing thing, right? It's amazing, like, like these pictures shown all throughout the world, whether it's in the Hindu world, in the military world, in the medical world, or even in the animal kingdom, there's, there's common grace of compassion. And while all these things are good and great, and I thank God for that, I, I don't think that's what Paul is talking about in this passage. Okay, remember that Paul was writing to the believers in Rome, right? To the Jews and to the Gentiles. They were believers already. All right, so in a time where Christians were persecuted and killed for their faith, we have a hard time understanding that in Orange County because we, we don't have that, right? But, but they live in a world that that happens. So Paul is addressing specifically to believers in a time of hardship. So we have to interpret this passage in its context. Okay, again, Paul says in verses 14 to 15, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Christian persecution happens when people verbally or physically abuse you because of your faith. That's what persecution is. Okay, so what should you do? What should we do when people persecute us? Fight back? You know, go to the gym, get pumped up so we can fight? You know, put on our gloves, ready to go to battle? Buy a gun, maybe? What should we do? According to Jesus. Jesus says, bless them. Do good to them. What? Bless and do good to our enemy who hurt us? I I think we can all agree that this is an insane command. Almost unreasonable. This, this command's insane, Lord. Who is able to do this? 
And the disciples, they often got on the Lord's case, like, who's able to do your commands? They're impossible. And Paul is only able to say this because he is living in the Spirit of Christ. He has the Holy Spirit within him. He's teaching what Jesus is teaching. And Jesus taught the same thing in Luke 6, 27 to 28. He says, But to you who are willing to listen, I say. Okay, first, first get this. Why did Jesus say, but to you who are willing to listen? What does that imply? That implies that a lot of people don't want to listen to Jesus because this is a very hard teaching. All right? So for those of you who are willing to listen, I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. Paul said the exact same thing because Paul is a disciple of Jesus. Paul follows Jesus. So Paul is saying exactly the same thing that Jesus is saying, right? So what does that even look like, All right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show us three examples from around the world. And with each example, I'm going to bring it a little bit closer to home each time. Okay? We, we've all known the atrocities of ISIS in the past couple of years. All right, ISIS, ISIS standing for the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. And this is an evil, violent, militant group that follows the fundamental doctrines of Sunni Islam. All right, they, they falsely believe that it is their God-given right to conquer the lands of Iraq and Syria. They belong, and, and also the lands beyond in the name of Allah. All right, that's why it's called Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. They want to conquer those lands. They want to overthrow the government. Right? And they say that you must convert to Islam or you will be killed. Those are the only two options. Convert or be killed. All right? And we would think, man, the, I thought these things happened only like in the middle, middle ages, like a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago. Like these are barbaric things. Does it happen still today? Yeah, literally it happens today. Like literally today, ISIS soldiers will capture Christians and force them to convert or they will kill them. So you see that the Christians in the Middle East right now, they live a very different life than, than we do here in OC, right? There, there's no such thing as a, as a lukewarm Christian there. There's no such thing. All right? You're either a serious follower of Jesus or you're not. There, there is no middle, middle ground. There are no Sunday Christians, all right? To say, I follow Jesus in the Middle East means that you're saying, I'm willing to die for my belief. I'm willing to die for Jesus. Okay. So I want to tell a story of, of this 10-year-old girl. Her name is Miriam. And she's from Mosul, Iraq. All right. Her family fled their homes uh, last July with hundreds of thousands of other refugees, other Christians. And they found safety in, in a refugee camp. All right. And so there was this journalist from a, from a TV station called SAT7 Kids, which is a children's, children, Christian children's station in Iraq. Can you believe that? It's, like, it's pretty amazing, right? So they have that station. And so the journalist visited this refugee camp, and they got connected to Miriam because she loves watching the Christian television program in Iraq, all right? And so when asked about what she thinks about the persecution of ISIS, her first response was, well, I, I praise God for not allowing ISIS to kill them because they did actually escape out of the territory. And then the journalist asked her again about her feelings of, towards those who, who forced her to flee from her home. Basically, how do you feel about the ISIS soldiers? And she said, she said this. She said, I will only ask God to forgive them. I will only ask God to forgive them. Why should they be killed? Because everyone else is saying, 
oh, I wish they would die. We just want to bomb them to smithereens, you know, like. And, and Miriam says, I, I just asked God to forgive them. Why should they be killed? And I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing from, from the mouth of a 10-year-old girl. I mean, if she was here at EFCI, she would be in the children's ministry. She would probably be in fifth grade, you know. Can we imagine someone in children's ministry say something like that? She did not seek revenge. She asked God to forgive them. And for that, Miriam, this 10-year-old, she's my hero. She is my hero. When, when she grows up, I, I believe she'll be an international peacemaker all around the world. And she embodies Romans 12, 14 that says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Here's my second example of Romans 12, 14, which hits closer to home because this happened on American soil. Last year, there was a horrific event that we all saw in the news, the, the Charleston church shooting in North Carolina. It was a mass shooting that took place in this, in this church called Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in downtown Charleston, South Carolina. And this was on June 17th of 2015. And, dr- and it was during a prayer meeting, a prayer service, all right? Nine uh, African-American Christians, they were praying in the church. And, and a, a Caucasian guy walks in and just starts firing and kills all nine of these believers, all right? including the senior pastor and also including a state senator, who was at the prayer meeting. And so the morning after the attack, the police arrested a 21-year-old, Dylan Roof. He was the killer, the murderer. And he was a young man. And Roof later confessed that he committed the shooting in hopes of igniting a race war. All right? Dylan was a, a white supremacist. He believed that all races were inferior to the white people, kind of like in Hitler's days, right? And he targeted unarmed black Christians at a prayer meeting. And it's, it's hard to find a more despicable act than this by a human being. And I can say it's probably true for the majority of the public that with every fiber of our being, we want to, I mean, we want to hate this guy. We, we want him to get beaten in prison. We want to see him get executed, right? And in his court appearance, when he went to court and there's a judge, the relatives of the victim, they can actually line up and they have a chance to say something to the killer. The killer is behind bars on a TV screen. So what's expected is that the the families, they can rebuke him, they can condemn him, as we would expect from all the pain that he has caused and all these families, right? But this is what happened. To everyone's shocking amazement. The Washington Post states it like this. One by one, those who choose to speak at, at a bond hearing did not turn to anger. Instead, while he remained impassive, like while Dylan was emotionless, no emotions, showing no signs of regret, no signs of remorse, these black believers' families They offered him forgiveness and said they were praying for his soul, even as they described the pain of their losses. I forgive you, said the daughter of a 70-year-old Ethel Lance, saying at the hearing, her voice breaking with emotion, she said to the killer, you took something very precious from me. I will never talk to her again. I will never ever hold her again, but I forgive you and have mercy on your soul. I couldn't believe what I was hearing when I saw this. I'm like, what? They have the capacity to forgive this guy? Time Magazine did an article on this asking a very heavy question. What does it take to forgive a killer? Think about it. What does it take to forgive a killer? 
I say it takes nothing less than a supernatural miracle. There is no way in our natural mind that we can forgive someone who kills our family. There's, there's just no way. In human terms, there is absolutely no way. It takes a supernatural indwelling of the Spirit of Christ, of the suffering Christ in our body, and being able to carry the, the intentional obedience to carry our cross on a daily basis. And when I say carrying our cross, it means being willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel. Outside of these two truths, there is no way, there, it is impossible to forgive. Okay, But they did it. The black Christians at this church, they did it. They are my heroes. I have so much to learn from them. I don't know if I have the capacity to do that if it happened to my own family. Third example, and this is going to... <laughs> okay. My third example of Romans twelve fourteen. This is going to hit very close to home for many of us at this church. Okay? And this is what I want to talk about. I want to talk about how Taiwanese Christians, Taiwanese American Christians, view and treat mainland Chinese people. Ooh, okay. This is a real taboo subject in the UFC churches at large. I might get in trouble for talking about this, but I have to talk about it because it is dear to my heart. And it is worth whatever the consequences that I may face later on at the staff meeting, all right? But I want to make a very clear distinction here. I'm not talking about politics. I'm not into politics. I'm not expressing my personal opinions on the political state of Taiwan and China. I'll leave that to the political experts. I'm not a politician. I'm no expert, okay? But I am a pastor. And so I want to talk about how the gospel affects us as a Christian people. I'm talking about the Chinese people. I'm talking about the Taiwanese people. The people who are made in the image of God. Like so many of you, I was raised in a Taiwanese home. We speak Taiwanese at home. We don't even speak Mandarin at home. If I speak Mandarin at home, it would just seem really awkward. All right? We are taught... I, I was taught by my parents to identify ourselves as, as Taiwanese, not Chinese. And as a kid, I really didn't understand why. I didn't know why, okay? And when I was filling out the forms for, for whatever, you know, legal document, it, they would always have, you know, choose, choose your race or ethnicity, right? And if it only had, like, you know, American, black, Mexican, Chinese, or Asian, or, or Chinese, like, I'm not, I'm not any of those, no. I would check other and put Taiwanese. Because I'm not Chinese, I'm Taiwanese. That's how I was raised. All right? And it was only later that I found out why our family was so against identifying ourselves as Chinese. And it was because of war and the effects of war. You see, from roughly 1927 to 1950, there was a, a major civil war. For those of you who are born here, you're about to have a history lesson, all right? For the older ones, you guys know this already, but I'm, ta I'm speaking to the younger ones, all right? From 1927 to 1950, there was a major civil war in China, all right, between the, the communists and the, the KMT, Kuomintang, nationalists. And so it was a war between Chairman Mao Zedong and, and between General Chiang Kai-shek, all right? And so the, the KMT army, they were losing the war. And so they retreated from China to Taiwan to regroup. Right? And in that process, the army needed a lot of resources to fight the, 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 the communists. And so they took a lot of land, they took a lot of food supplies, and they, and they even took people from the local Taiwanese people. And laws were passed by force. All right, and, and the locals had to, had to obey, had to submit. 
And this actually affected my family in a very, very personal way. Because when the soldiers, the KMT soldiers came to Taiwan, most of my great-grandparents' land, they, they owned farmland. They were confiscated because it was turned into military land. And our family was left with almost nothing. All right. Well, here's, here's the kicker. One of the KMT soldiers tried to get with one of my great aunts. I didn't know her. I, I, I hear stories from my family. All right. she tr he, he tried to get with my great aunt without her consent, if you know what I mean. All right. My grandmother, at that time, tried to stop him. And the soldier shot my grandma right in the stomach. And the thing was, my grandma was pregnant at the time. Well, who was in my grandmother's stomach? It was my mother. It was my mom. Luckily, both my grandma and my mom survived. She was born early, two months early. My grandma didn't even know if she would, she would make it. So she didn't even register her birthday because she thought, well, she's being born premature, so, so she might not make it, so there's, we don't have to register, you know? So I always get confused. I'm like, Mom, when's your birthday? You, well, my real birthday or, or my registered birthday? You know, and then there's also the, the, the lunar calendar and then also the regular calendars. I'm like, Mom, you got four birthdays. I can't keep up with this. I have no idea when your birthday is, right? And so they both survived. Or I would not be standing here, obviously, you know. Some of you are like, did she make it? Did she make it? <laughs> yes, she did make it, all right? I'm standing here. She did make it. All right. And, and this is the reason why our family didn't identify ourselves as Chinese. Because our family saw the mainlanders as our enemies. And all that happened during wartime, all right? And that was the, the horrible negative effects of war. War is not pretty, guys. War is horrific. And so, from a human standpoint, I can see why families, like my family, was so anti-China. People were hurt, land was taken, food was stolen, and so from a human standpoint, there can be no reconciliation. There can be no peace. There can be no forgiveness. As you can see, I love using Time Magazine for some reason, right? Because somehow they're kind of neutral on these things. So Time did plenty of cover articles on this situation. You know, can, can China quell call, uh, call Taiwan's mounting demand for independence? You know, like, want to split up? Or, or maybe this political demonstration in the, in the streets of Taiwan for independence? You know, one, one Taiwan, one China, what does that mean? Like, hey, China's one country, Taiwan's one country. You know, that's, that's what it means. If I was not a Christian, I would probably be enraged by the atrocities that happened to my family. I would hate the soldier who shot my grandma. I would hate the soldiers who caused my mom to be prematurely birthed and almost died. I would want to fight our enemies, our enemies. And I honestly don't believe that this conflict can be solved apart from putting our trust in Christ. But I am a Christian now. And to follow Christ means that I have to respond differently than my natural flesh. And so Paul tells us, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Romans 12, 14. How do I do that? How do I reconcile that? And this is my personal method, all right? This is how I do it personally. And I think it might work for you if you're struggling with it too, because this is what I do. I separate the politics from the people. I separate the politics from the people, all right? Again, I want to be very clear. I'm not making a political statement. That's not my intent. I'm not taking any sides. So there's no use coming up to me after service to accuse me of taking sides. I'm not. All right? But I'm talking about a Christian response to conflict. That's what I'm talking about. And, you know, it doesn't just happen to Taiwan and China. You think 
America was just birthed out of nothing? Where did America come from, guys? Huh? It came from England, right? And depending on which side you were on, you were either the revolutionaries or you were the rebels. Right? The 4th of July. It is either Independence Day in the eyes of Americans or it could be the rebellion of the colonies if you were a Brit. So it's not just us. It's all over the world. So I'm talking about a Christian response to political conflict. All right? You see the difference? I'm not taking sides. All right? You can have your political convictions. That's fine with me. All right? Either way, to me, it really doesn't matter. But we are, first and foremost, Christians. We are first and foremost Christians. We are citizens of heaven. We're ambassadors for Christ. That is our identity. Therefore, we should treat mainland Chinese people with decency and with respect. And we can't hate someone for the sins of their grandparents. They didn't even do anything to me personally. So how can I hold a grudge for two generations, for three generations, and for some, for some other conflicts around the world? They might hold a grudge for 10 generations, 20 generations. And even if they did hurt me or my family personally, I am commanded by Christ, as a follower of Christ, to forgive our enemies and to pray for them. Furthermore, we ought to walk the extra mile to extend our hand to them through the sharing of the gospel. We should care about their souls. We should welcome them into our EFC churches and break bread together, have fellowship together, so that they can put their trust in Christ, who can really save them and give them eternal hope, much more than any political system that we put our hopes in. As Christians, would you not agree that our hope in Christ is greater than any of our hope in a po political system? Whether you're Democratic, Republican, Independent, Blue, Red, Green, is Christ not greater than that? I'm proud that our church allowed us to take mission teams over to China to share the gospel. This was a, a picture of our, our mission team. You know, it's all people from, from this church, actually. And uh, we, we were in China in 2009, and we we're, were doing the, the drama King of Hearts at this church, and we stayed there for, for three weeks, and we forged amazing friendships over there. And the Christians in China are, are some of the kindest people that I've, I've ever met some of the most humble people, because they are being persecuted. We, we, we have to meet in secret when we go and do youth camps and college camps. And I can't tell you how many times that we almost got busted by, by the religious bureau and by the police, you know? We would be meeting inside, having a camp of maybe 100 120, 180 students, and we're like just praising our hearts out, worshiping, we're sharing the gospel, we're teaching the word of God to all the students that, that are hungry, they were so hungry for the word of God, you know, and all of a sudden, like, maybe a church leader would come, hey, the police are here, we need to go hide. And so we scramble, trying to find different rooms to hide in. But it was through that, it was like, it was like refiner's fire. It strengthened our faith. It strengthened our bond with the mainland believers because we, we went through that together. Right? In 2008, the year of Beijing Olympics, Amy and I went with a team of people. And we traveled hours and hours onto a very rural uh, city that never had any like, youth camp or anything. Right? So basically, the, the young people that have never heard the gospel. And 
And I was like, oh, this is great. I remember exactly the date, August 8, 2008, the, the opening ceremony of Beijing Olympics. And I was like, this is great. After we you know, do the youth camp in the morning, we're going we're gonna to go to the pastor's house at night. We're going to watch the opening ceremony. It's going to be so fun. It's going to be so fun. And while we were leading songs in the morning, you know, I see a few heads in the back looking in. I'm like, I see like four or five adults, and I'm like, oh, those must be the parents of the youth. Oh, they, they care about their young people. That's so awesome, you know? And then the pastor comes up to me, and he goes, run. That's the religious bureau. <laughs> run. <laughs> I'm like, who do I run? I'm like up here leading song. I can't just like take off and run. I'm like, and, and then we had, we had a plan B, all right? We're like, okay, we knew that we, we might have gotten in trouble, right? Because it's illegal to do Christian activities without registering with the government. And so our, what was our plan B? Our plan B was putting a huge banner up over, uh, over the camp. It says, it says um, some, to the effect of, go, go, Beijing Olympics, you know? Like, <laughs> like Beijing Jiao, Aohin Jiao. That's what I said exactly, all right? And we're like, that's our plan B. If, 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 the, if the police come, we're going to say we're, we're, this is an Olympics gathering. We're cheering for the Olympics. <laughs> and, and so we're like, and so he's like, and so he took over. And he went on stage and he's like, all right, kids, you know, all right, let's do our chant. Beijing Jayo, Ao In Jayo, Beijing Jayo, Ao In Jayo. And, and the kids, you know, they just went along with it. Yeah, yeah, Beijing Olympics, yes. And in the meantime, we're trying to get our stuff, and we're running out the back door, right? <laughs> and um, where was I going with this? Okay. Anyways, we ran. You know, we, we went to a hiding place. And, uh, and the pastor later comes up to, to us and go, you know what? You know, they're going to shut us down if we don't get you guys out of here. They know you guys are foreigners, meaning that you're, you guys are Southern Chinese. <laughs> they thought we were Southern Chinese. They're like, they, they look, their their skin's too white, you know, and their hair's too long. They must be from the South. They can't come up North here to preach the gospel, you know. I'm like, well, oh. luckily they didn't know we were from America. <laughs> that church would have been shut down right there. They're like, get those Southerners out of here, you know. And and so we went, and we're like, so we were refugees on the run. We hopped on our in our car and we drove six hours or eight hours back to Beijing back to our, you know, our home base. And so we, we kind of knew what it was like being refugees, actually. <laughs> and I was like, oh, man, this is a bad day. This is a very bad day. I'm missing the opening ceremony, and we're, we're refugees on the run, you know. <laughs> but all in all, we were, we were still kept relatively safe, you know. Was it worth it, being busted? I would say, yeah, it was really worth it. <laughs> because, and, and if I had the chance to do it again, I would do it all over again. In fact, we've done it many, many times. Seven years in a row, eight years in a row. Despite the dangers. Because we value the eternal life of these college students more than our political differences, more than just whatever different things that we believe in. It doesn't matter. Because as Christians, we should care about each other's souls. The gospel should come first. No, yeah, yeah, this one. Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ. This is what Paul said to the Galatians church. You see, if, he were, if Paul was standing right here in this church today, he would say, you see, there is neither Taiwanese or mainland Chinese, for we are all one in Christ. Picture this. I want you to use your imagination, all right? Imagine that we've all passed from this life and we, we went to heaven, okay? It's a glorious heaven. And, and, and Father God is up here in his throne and he's like, come, come all my children. 
the white guys, you guys stay here, the Mexicans stay here, the Taiwanese stay here, the mainlanders stay there. You guys worship me in separate sections, all right? All right, very good. Now, now carry on. Do you think that would happen in heaven? I hope not. Shoot. That would be horrible that we're still segregated in heaven. All right. Taiwanese service at 9 o'clock in heaven. At 10 o'clock, we've got the white people that come, all right? Be sure not to intermingle. That would be absolutely ridiculous. I'm imagining heaven to be like a limitless space and billions of believers gathering together at the same time, having their hands up and worshiping our almighty and awesome God. And I believe that when we get to heaven, the Father will say to us, Come, come, all my children. I love you all. You are all my favorite. Every single one of you are the apple of my eye. And come and sit at my banqueting table, and I offer you all types of food. Chinese food, Mexican food, fish tacos, pork song, you know, everything you want, metaphorically, all right? And you see, we, we can have so much more joy in our hearts when we unite together as a body of Christ, and there is no separation, and we can enjoy each other's culture, we can enjoy each other's food, we can even enjoy each other's movies, you know? Well, this, I'll explain this picture real quick. This was in Inner Mongolia. And it, our team was made of, of Taiwanese Americans and mainland Americans. And we're going to China to, and, and we're ministering to, to the college to students and the young adults. And we're just praying together. And we have just become really good friends. I even stay in contact with them through social media. Back to the point, we can enjoy each other's cultures. We can enjoy each other's movies. Next slide. It doesn't matter what your political stance is. I know that there's probably many different you know, views in here, but I know that many of you have at least seen one of these movies. Right? Huan Zhu Gege, The Pearl Princess. All right. Or Internal Affairs. I mean, I'm talking to older fellas. You guys probably don't know these movies. But... You know, internal affairs, Wu Jin Dao, right? Or Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, like Wu Hu Chang Long, right? All right, so you've seen at least one, if you've seen at least one of these movies, raise your hand. If you've seen at least one. Yeah. So anybody that's over like 21 have seen something like this, right? And the rest of you are like, huh, what's that? <laughs> Just ask your parents, okay? <laughs> and my bet is you loved it. You watched it and you loved it just like I did, all right? And guess what? All of the filming locations were not in Taiwan. <laughs> they were all in China. All right. The Pearl Princess was shot in Beijing. All right. Internal Affairs was shot in Hong Kong. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, it was shot in Anhui and, Xi, and, and uh, Xinjiang. All right. And we get to enjoy just the beauty of, of the movie. Just the, the comedy, the scenery, the, the acting, everything, you know? And I'm using th th this movie as a metaphor. That if we embrace each other as a people, that we can enjoy life so much more. All right. If you say, no, I only watch Taiwanese movies. Oh, man, then you don't have a lot of choices, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> you laughed a little too loud there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, in conclusion, forgiving and loving our enemies is the only is only possible when we have a genuine relationship with Jesus. In human terms, it is impossible to bless those who persecute us. Impossible. It's really, really impossible. But because we claim to be Christians, because we claim that we have repented from our sins, because we claim that we have believe in the power of the gospel to reconcile men to God and men to men. We claim that we are willing to walk the narrow path. We claim that we are willing to carry our cross to follow him. We claim that we have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us. If we claim all of that, then we are obligated to follow the divine ethic that Jesus commanded us. 
to forgive and to love our enemies. And at this time, God may be convicting some of us. God may be speaking to some of our hearts the way that we view and treat certain groups of people. Right? Maybe it may be the mainland Chinese, it may be the Mexicans, the Indians, the Arabs, or maybe it may be the rich and the powerful, or maybe the poor and the homeless, or maybe the people in authority, or it may be people in our family that have hurt us in very bad ways. And perhaps there's a prejudice inside of us, inside of our heart, that is hiding on the inside. But God sees it all, and he wants to transform our hearts to be more like Jesus. And this is where we come humbly before God. And if I can get the worship team to maybe just play a little bit in the background, we'll have a little bit of response time. This is, this is where we come humbly before God, and we repent, and we ask for his forgiveness. And perhaps there's a lot of pain in some of our hearts because of the pain caused by others. And it's just so hard to let it go. Maybe it's been generations. The bad stuff that has happened to your family, I understand. It happened in my family. God understands. He, he was there when it happened. But we still have to let it go and let God take control of our heart. And you may mourn, you may weep on the inside because it's so hard to let go, but you know as a Christian, you're commanded to. And if you mourn and if you weep on the inside, we will weep with you as a family of God. We will live out Romans 12, 15 together with you. And the Bible promises in Psalm 35, that weeping may last through the night, but joy comes with the morning. Once we weep and turn from our ways and we turn to God, there will be a newfound joy that will fill our lives in the morning. And when this happens, when there's that great breakthrough in your life, we will rejoice with you as a church family. So let us bow our heads and pray. Father, Holy Spirit, would you speak to our hearts right now, God? Is there something that's been hidden or buried deep inside that, that you want to deal with, that you want to heal? Maybe there's some brokenness that, God, you want to heal today, this morning. Would you do a supernatural miracle right now, God, in the lives of our congregation? Just take a minute to respond to God right now in silence. This is a holy moment for some of you. With every head bow, I want to make an invitation to you. I invite those who want to respond to God, to his word today, to raise your hand right now because I want to pray for you. If you want to forgive your enemy, forgive those who have hurt you, persecuted you, abused you, And you can only do that in the power of Christ within you. Just raise your hand. I want to pray for you. God bless 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 you.
we will weep with you and we will rejoice with you as a church family. You are not alone. Heavenly Father, we come before you and you see our hearts, God. And I know that you are doing a refining work in our lives, that we can walk more and more like you, God, that we can forgive those who have hurt us, that we can bless those who persecuted us, and that we can rejoice and weep with one another as a big family in Christ. I pray for those who have responded to your message today, God. I pray that you would do a mighty work in their hearts even now, God, that you would release your spirit of healing upon them. That you would release a spirit of joy that is beyond understanding in their lives. Heal the generational wounds, God. And do what only you can do, Holy Spirit, in this supernatural healing. Because we admit we cannot do it by ourselves. We admit we are so weak. We can't do it. We need you, God. We are desperate for you to make things right because we love you and we want to obey all that you have commanded. Would you make this right in our lives? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us all stand for the closing prayer. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.